Up next, we have Mike Battaglia. He's a forest researcher with the US Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in Fort Collins, Colorado. His research focuses on developing management strategies to enhance forest resilience to disturbance. Uh, he's worked across the interior west in ecosystems ranging from low elevation ponderosa pine to high elevation subalpine spruce fir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's like I'm a boy band or something. <laughs> So thanks everybody, this has been a really good conference. I appreciate being invited. Uh, this is my first time and I'm learning a lot. And I'm gonna be building a little bit on um, what Crystal talked about and Derek talked about this morning. And that's uh, looking at these forest structure outcomes after mixed severity fires and whether or not they're reading, meeting the restoration goals that we put forward um, for our desired conditions on the front range. And so uh, I don't really need to belabor this, but wild, wildfire is a very important uh, disturbance in Ponderosa Pine dominated forest and I'm going to be talking about those along the Colorado Front Range which is basically from the Wyoming border down to Colorado Springs a little further south um, here I guess we're right here um, about 300 miles east of here on the drier side of the Rocky Mountains and in terms of um, the Front Range I wanted to give you guys some context because we've been talking about the Southwest we've been talking about Oregon and California the, but Colorado Front Range has a little bit longer of a uh, fire regime or fire uh, interval at our low elevation forests along where most of the people live. We have fires every 8 to 20 years, and they're typically at low severity. Um, but as you go up higher in elevation, and we have a mix of ponderosa pine and Douglas fir, we start seeing fire intervals lengthen between 20 and 40 years, and um, we get a lot of mixed severity fire in those, in those systems. So there's, there's mixtures of low severity fires, but there's also some patches of high severity uh, fires. And so this is what a typical uh, historical forest looked like. Uh, this is off the Pike National Forest near Colorado Springs. Um, from the Jack 1900 report, you can see it's very open. Uh, you can see a grassy understory. You can also see, um, and this is a problem we have on the Front Range, not very large trees. Um, they're, they're pretty short compared to other places in the West, and they're definitely not uh, large diameter, give you a big hug around them. They're pretty small. This is another picture of um, around 1899 on the Pike National Forest. And I, what I want to show here is this is what Derek was talking about earlier today. We have those individual trees. We have that spatial complexity, that heterogeneity. We have open ends. We have groups of trees. And, and you can see across this whole area, um, there's a lot of uh, spatial complexity on the forest. And of course, fire exclusion, there was a lot of uh, logging on the Front Range around 1860 when they discovered gold. Um, and it supported all the Boulder, Golden, um, and uh, Denver uh, building up those cities. So they did a lot of logging up there. And so what we see today is a, a big change. Um, it didn't flood. We actually made a, a, a reservoir right here. But you know, from here on up, you can see that we filled in the area. All those open areas are now starting to close up. We have contiguous forest um, like this. Um, this is all ponderosa pine, but really what we have coming up in our understory is a lot of Douglas fir and, and ponderosa pine, so a lot of ladder fuels. And so that's leading to a lot of crown fires. Uh, this is the Hayman fire, which is the largest uh, wildfire in Colorado history outside of Manitou Experimental Forest. And so what I wanted to show you is this map here. This is the front range. Uh, here's Fort Collins, Colorado Springs. These little yellow dots here were fires that happened before 1996. And they were very small in size. I guess we were pretty good at putting them out or um, they just didn't get as large. But after 1996, we started having a series of wildfires. And those are these big red blobs. This is the Hayman fire. This is High Park, which happened in 2012 outside of Fort Collins. Um, a lot of these destroyed a lot of homes, a lot of acreages. Um, and so we, we started having a, a fire problem just like everybody else in the West. And so these, these fires, instead of being those mixed severity, low severity fires, are trending towards much higher um, severity fires. This is a picture of the Hayman fire. This is that Cheeseman uh, reservoir that I was talking about that we filled in. But this is a five mile across high severity patch without any refugia in, in this area of, of tree refugia. And so this is a map, an MTBS map of the Hayman. Again, this is that big patch right there. 
Um, so there's a lot of red and it's really contiguous and, and there's no doubt there was high severity events in the Colorado Front Range. The, the uh, debate is how large those high severity patches were. And, and I, would, I would contend that we didn't have these big, really large high severity patches in our Ponderosa Pine Forest. The other thing I, wanted, I want you to note is the green and the yellow. And the, I guess that's green. Um, I, that's Forest Service green, I guess, right there. Um, and yellow. And there's a lot of that also within the, the, the High Park uh, fire, or sorry, the Hayman fire. And so I'm going to get to that in a minute. But again, we have a lot of people living on the Front Range. We have, I guess, 5 million people in Colorado. 4 million of them live on the Colorado Front Range. This is where our water comes from, from those mountains. We're also seeing a lot of um, impact to our trees uh, in terms of mortality. And so because of these wildfires, uh, the Front Range Roundtable was formed in the early 2000s um, to address uh, the fact that we're having all these wildfires, what can we do? And, and at first, they just started talking about fuels treatment. So we, knew, we know we need to reduce densities. We know from those historic pictures, we have to reduce densities. And so that's where it started. Um, but then uh, the CFLRP program came aboard, and they were successful in getting a, a CFLRP on the um, Colorado Front Range, which includes the Arapaho Roosevelt and the, the Pike National Forest. And uh, we've been working at that, looking at desired conditions, um, and trying to get some of that work done. So what was identified in that proposal was that we needed to do over 300,000 hectares of restoration work along the Colorado Front Range. Up until 2015, we've done about 18,000 hectares, uh, which isn't really that much. Between that time as well, we've had three really large fires. We had the High Park Fire outside of Fort Collins, the Waldo Canyon, which was outside of Colorado Springs, and the Black Forest Fire. Not only did they burn up a lot of acreage, uh, they destroyed a lot of homes, and it cost a bunch of money to suppress. And so while there was high severity events in that, I wanted to look at, um, so the media and everybody always focuses on the high severity portion of these wildfires. And I was thinking to myself, you know, there's a lot of green and a lot of yellow in there. There's a lot of low and moderate severity fire. Over 55% of those three fires had low and moderate severity fires. And so I wanted to look at, well, let's try and make some lemonade out of lemons, uh, see what we can do with that. And so what was interesting was these are the structures that we were seeing in those low and moderate severity fires. You know, we have these open trees, we have crown base heights being left, uh, lifted, we're getting lower uh, surface fuel loads. We're creating the structures that we had decided on in our, our restoration efforts for desired conditions. So, so all these low and moderate fire, or severity fire areas, there's open areas, there's dense areas, there's uh, moderate dense areas, and we're creating a lot of uh, this complexity that we've been looking at. This is a, a picture of the Hayman from above. And you can see there's some open ends here and there's some individual trees and some groups. And so we're creating that, this is a four hectare or 10 acre block right here of area that we're, we're recreating that heterogeneity that we, we've been trying to, to, to create mechanically. And so what I wanted to do is look at what was coming out of these fires um, and quantify the, the structure in these, the low and moderate severity fires of these areas. And this is based on a stand level, not on a landscape level. I should point that out. And I wanted to look at that and see how well they're, they're moving us towards those restoration goals that we're trying to do mechanically. And so those desired conditions that we had defined um, in 2014 during the CFLRP was we wanted to move our forest structure towards historical conditions. We wanted to reduce density, we wanted to reduce basal area, and we wanted to create that fine scale heterogeneity of those single trees, groups of trees in the open ends. In the open ends. And so what I did is I took data from two different studies that I'm involved in, and, and so this is a very collaborative uh, research project. This first one is the Front Range Forest Restoration Network, where we went um, and, and sampled 179 plots across the whole Front Range to inform what those desired conditions should be in terms of basal areas, species compositions, spatial patterns. So before 2009, we really didn't have a good idea of what even those numbers should be. We were basing it on Southwest, Oregon, Northern Rockies, and as you can see, well, as you'll see, the numbers are a little bit different, still in the same way. But yeah, this was, this was a big project. We're finishing this one up. Um, the second project 
that I brought into this was a, a project that was led by Paula Fonwalt um, and at the research station where we were looking at um, mapping low, moderate, and high severity fires on the front range. These were four hectare maps and we mapped all the surviving trees and we were looking at the regeneration response that was coming back spatially. And so we took these two data sets um, and combined them to, to look, at the, look at this data. And so these next three graphs are gonna be kind of the same, uh, except for the y-axis, which this one is trees per hectare. On the left is residual, that's what the residual forest was after the wildfire. Uh, this middle one, historical, is the structure that was there in 1860, because that's when um, we started doing the, the harvesting on, on the front range, and then current is what our contemporary um, values are now. And so, I will start with current. Um, we have about, on average, 427 trees per hectare. Um, and you can see there's a wide range of variability. Historically, we only had 142 on average. And again, there was a little bit of variability. Residual, after the fire, we went down to 218. So we reduced density by fit, about 50%. We're moving our trees per uh, hectare from the current down towards um, the historical. We didn't make that mark, but we're still within that, that variability, so we're moving in the right direction. In terms of basal area, again, here's some uh, numbers around, currently we're around 17, but we can get up to 40 meters squared per hectare, which is pretty dense. Um, Historically, we're around eight meters squared per hectare. There's a little bit of range, but you can notice there's over 80% of our stands are less than 10 meters squared per hectare when we do the reconstructions. And then res our residuals were about 10 and a half. Again, there's a lot of variability out there, but again, we're moving back towards that historical reference condition. And then in terms of QMD, quadratic mean diameter, this is why you could laugh at our numbers here. Um, on average, Currently, we're around 24.6. Historically, we were only at 28 centimeters. That's, that's not very big. Uh, we would get some up into the 50s and 60s, but that was on a rare occasion. Most of the stuff that we reconstructed was between, we'll say, 25 and 35 centimeters. So you can chuckle now. Um, thank you. It's also why we don't have a, a timber industry on the front range. Um, but in terms of residual, where that fire moved it towards, we went, uh, we raised that uh, QMD to about 25.8. Still not getting as high, but we're, 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 we're moving towards um, that condition of historical conditions. The other thing that was, was interesting about this area, so we have, again, the residual forest, the unburned forest, which should say contemporary forest and historical. This green is the proportion of the ponderosa pine that was out there. Uh, that gray is the proportion of Douglas fir. And so um, you can see like historically in, in an unburned forest, um, we have uh, a little bit more uh, Douglas fir currently, and then this, this blue is uh, Rocky Mountain juniper, aspen, and lodgepole. In that residual forest post-fire, we killed a lot of that Doug fir. We killed a lot of that juniper. Um, and lodgepole, and we have a lot more ponderosa pine. So in terms of species composition, I still think we moved towards that ponderosa pine domination, um, but we did get rid of a, a little bit more Douglas fir um, than uh, we wanted to, and there's a reason for that. Most of the Douglas fir that was in, the un or in those forest types were under 20 centimeters. They all established in the, around 1900, and so they're, they're all pretty small. So the other thing about what we wanted to look at was what, what happened in terms of spatial complexity. And so um, right here, we didn't map the control um, unburned areas. We just mapped the residual forest and the historical forest. And you can see here's that individual tree, uh, two to four trees in a group, five to nine, 10 to 15, and 16 plus. So um, what we can see is that those fires broke up those groups that were um, 16, 10, 10 and 15 and they broke them up, um, moved them into individual trees in groups of two to four and five to nine, which, which is what we're trying to do mechanically as well. So there's a concern, um, I know in high severity fires that we're not getting the regeneration back. Um, that wasn't the case in our low and moderate severity areas. In fact, we have over a thousand seedlings per hectare coming back. Most of that is ponderosa pine. We have a lot of aspen coming back. So these low and moderate severity fires, they, what they did is they removed that surface fuel 
um, but they didn't remove the seed source very much. And so that, that's good. That's how these processes are supposed to work. But the question is now, what do we do with these, with these landscapes? Now that we have these landscapes that have the structure that we were going towards in terms of trying to get that mechanically, um, we have lower surface fuels, we're getting that regeneration, what, what is it that we do next? We always talk about restoration, and, and restoration is not a one-time gig. These forests are dynamic. As a civil culturist, I'm always thinking about what's going to happen in the next 20, 40, 60, 100 years. What is this forest going to look like, and what do I do uh, in terms of management to, to get it there? And so I would, I would say that we have an opportunity. We're having all these wildfires. They're doing a lot of, of um, they're doing some damage. That's right. There's high severity portions, but there's a lot of areas that are low and moderate severity that we can work with um, in terms of management. And it would be a lot easier to, to reintroduce fire into those systems. And so what I would contend is that we, start, we should start by putting prescribed fire in these, in these areas that have already burned at low and moderate severity areas. We've been talking about we're only able to do 300 acres or 600 acres at a time. And these large patches of areas where the surface fuels have already been uh, cleaned up after 100 years of fire exclusion, we have an opportunity to introduce fire 10, 15 years after that wildfire, get it back on that, that maintenance cycle. And so I just wanted to talk about, we haven't done that on the Front Range yet, but we have done that on the Black Hills, um, in the Black Hills of South Dakota within the Jasper Fire, which was also a very large wildfire where we, we reintroduced prescribed fire into uh, a moderate severity area and a high severity area. I'm not going to talk about the high severity area, I'll just let you know it was really hot, it killed pretty much all the natural regeneration that came back after the high severity fire, but it did reduce the, the coarse woody debris. Um, so significantly. So if they want to plant there, they can now without fear of uh, that burning up again. So I just want to show you some, some data from this. This is uh, coarse woody debris in the moderate severity areas, a frequency distribution. And you can see there's some heavy areas. And so for those of you that don't know what megagrams per hectare, just uh, divide it by two in your head. It's, it's two, two and a half. Just, just do that. So um, on average, it was about 17. So you know, eight or nine tons per acre out there, of course, we do debris. And you can see the frequency distribution here. Um, there were some heavies um, and, and um, some light areas. So it was pretty heterogene heterogeneous. After that, that prescribed fire, what we did is we reduced um, that coarse woody debris by half. Um, we moved that frequency distribution to the left. And there's a lot of areas that don't even have any uh, coarse woody debris on the area. So this area now is, is primed to, to burn again, it won't burn as intensely uh, because we've now uh, removed a lot of that material. And this is what it looks like from the, from the air. You can see the logs were consumed. You still have an overstory. There was some scorch. Um, this was already, um, actually that actually burnt, burned out, um, torched out, but it, it did create some um, conditions. This isn't one of my plots though, so I, I didn't pick up that mortality. Just so you know. Um, the, uh, in terms of seedlings per hectare, so the Black Hills has this uh, problem. It's a regeneration problem. They have too many trees. On the front range, sometimes we don't get our regeneration. They get regeneration if you sneeze. And so this is, this is the average um, trees per hectare after 12 years after this moderate severity fire. So we have 2,500 trees per acre or per hectare even have some areas up into the 10,000, 8,000. They are not fun to, to measure. But after that fire, again, we moved that, that frequency distribution to the left. We killed a lot of trees. We still have 835 trees per he hectare, which is still above stocking limits. Um, a lot of areas, though, 50, almost 50% of our plots didn't have any regeneration. But I'm not worried about that, because I know that um, we didn't kill a lot of the overstory. We still have a seed source we'll get a no, another cohort of regeneration coming in. And so just so you know, we really didn't kill, there was not a lot of significant mortality in these overstory uh, trees with that, that prescribed burn. Um, we're still around six meters squared per hectare in the overstory. We still have about 90 trees per hectare um, in that overstory, in those moderate severity areas. So just um, for take home, and I'm glad I have time um, uh, to have a discussion about this because 
uh, I think this is, this is the place to have this discussion. Um, you know, we know that wildfires are always going to be a part of the ponderosa pine system. And these are ideal areas that are moving us towards those desired conditions that we identified in our restoration guidelines. Um, we've already reduced those tree densities, we reduced the surface fuel loads, and then reintroduction of prescribed fire just makes sense to me uh, in these areas. So I don't want to belabor this, but um, we still have an opportunity to produce wood products in these restoration areas and where we're doing some burning. And so I didn't want to leave that out. Um, it might not happen in the front range. Um, you know, a 12 inch tree is, is pretty big up out there uh, and it takes like 150 years to get that big. So uh, it's not gonna happen. But in the Black Hills and other places where it's more productive, maybe in the Southwest and Oregon, we still need to be conscious that we are the Forest Service and we do wanna make sure that we are producing some kind of timber um, and not, um, not belabor that. But for the front range, I think uh, it makes a lot of sense. Most of our material is non-merchantable. We're doing a lot of treatments. It costs $800, $1,000 an acre to treat. And it really makes sense to, do, to use it as woody biomass for fossil fuels, uh, to offset those fossil fuels. And this is a picture um, in Boulder County, are my, my fellow friends over there. They, they uh, heat their buildings with biomass that's coming off the um, county open space lands. And so, you know, these kinds of, of activities, I think, would, would move us forward and, and utilize that material rather than just pile burning um, that material. Uh, with that, uh, if you need to contact me, uh, there's my email, and uh, I'll, I'll be around until tomorrow night. So, thank you. We have some time for questions. Yeah. Right. Um, how much were, how much of a problem uh, or an issue in our uh, insect, post fire insect infestations in these, particularly the, the moderate severity areas? How much do you have to adjust for that or, or uh, maybe address that general issue? Sure. Um, so the question was how much um, impact or, or how, would, how much insect activity were in these moderate severity areas? Uh, in the in the fires, so um, we didn't. I shouldn't I, my perception of it is we didn't see a lot of um, beetle activity in these wildfire footprints. Now, when we did the prescribed fire in the Jasper fire, there was also an epidemic of mountain pine beetle going on um, in that area adjacent, and uh, some of the trees did get hit with mountain pine beetle after the fire, after the second fire. Um, so, you know, it was a learning lesson, like, well, maybe we shouldn't prescribe burn when there's a mountain pine beetle epidemic going on that's affecting half of the forest. Um, but I, we didn't see a, on the front range, we did not see a significant amount of pine beetle um, coming into um, our wildfires. Yes. And so I'm wondering, you know, thinking about the opportunities to reintroduce prescribed fire into those systems, whether that would run counter to the concerns the water companies have about um, short scale, low, low level erosion events and things like that. Sure. So the question was. Um, a lot of the activities that are going on in the front range in terms of restoration are being driven by water municipalities and reintroducing fire into those systems, how would that in terms of erosion, low, low level erosion and how that would impact them. Um, it's really interesting because we have a lot of collaboration with those water um, municipalities and they are, they are pro burning um, because they, I mean, uh, because they they want they know that when you do have a wildfire you get a lot of uh, sediment and so they they really do would rather have a little bit at a time to clear off the the overstory um, and they're doing a lot of the treatments on their own land so Denver Water is one of those um, one thing that happened I don't know if you guys know know about the Lower North Fork in Colorado that was actually on Denver Water land uh, Colorado State Forest Service was doing the burned. Um, then there's, 
it, it, got, it escaped and, and it was a big mess. It shut down for Sky Fire in Colorado for a while. Um, but that was actually on Denver waterland. So they're pretty um, adamant about incorporating fire as well. They sit on the round table um, collaborative with us. Yeah. One more. Sure. Um, So um, the question is, if we were going to reintroduce fire into the uh, Colorado Front Range, how frequent would that be? Um, you know, it, it's definitely site specific, depending on what elevation you're at. Um, but I would say when we did it in the Black Hills, we did it too soon. Um, not all the snags had fallen down and the regeneration wasn't tall enough. Um, I would say at least 20 years, I would give it at least 20 years for the, for the dead material to to fall down, um, and for any of that regeneration that was coming in, um, you want some of it to survive. Because in the Colorado, it's different than in the Black Hills where we don't get the regeneration every year. It's very episodic, it has to all line up. And so um, I wouldn't do it right away, but I would definitely wait you know, 10, 15, 20 years before um, I reintroduce, reintroduce fire into those systems. Gloria? Would you go far as wait, your data is saying that even in terms of fire history uh, and Denver pedology, that there's no evidence for big yellow bellies or anything like that with farmers in the front range? Uh, so, okay. Um, so the question was based on our reconstruction, um, there's not evidence of big yellow bellies on the, on the, on the front range. I wouldn't say. Um, there was no evidence, it just wasn't the prevalent um, size. And I think that has to do with not only productivity, but also we had, um, we did have mixed severity fires where, where we have blowouts. Um, I, when we would go and reconstruct the stump, because we went and reconstructed stumps, we, you know, our stumps would be maybe that big. They weren't big. I mean, I'm talking about like Sierra Nevada when I read those papers and and they have, 80 centimeter trees or their QMDs are 50 centimeters and just like, God, I, I can't even imagine. Every time I go anywhere else, I get this, this tree envy. Um, <laughs> and uh, there were large trees. They just weren't as prevalent as what you see in the Southwest or, or elsewhere. You go to Boulder County. <laughs> Sorry, our, just to give you some reference, our side indices, um, on a base age 100 range between 30 and 60. Um, if that gives you any, um, you won't feel sorry for us. <laughs> yeah. So um, can we work fire on front range? I know that socially accepted for prescribed fire is pretty much low. Um, how, if you want to re-engage more prescribed fire on the front range, how do you anticipate shifting yeah, so the question was, um, on the front range, the social acceptance for prescribed fire is pretty low. Um, how, and how are we going to shift that? Um, you know, I think, especially after Lower North Fork, it, it declined. The other issue um, that they like to use is smoke, but apparently um, we've only exceeded smoke a couple of times over the last, you know, all of our burns. Uh, Denver is pretty sensitive to smoke. Uh, we have a lot of cars. I think um, part of it is education, but in, in levels of success. So they actually today they're burning in Red Feather uh, Lakes right outside of Fort Collins, which is great. And and so I think we're incrementally starting to do more prescribed fire. And as as we do, and when we do it now, they're in the newspapers and talking about the good fire, not the bad fire. So I think the level of education, um, I'm indoctrinating my kids and their friends <laughs> about fire. Um, but I think it's gonna take a lot of success. And the other thing is whenever we have a wildfire, um, that really sparks people like, well, why aren't we doing more? So um, hopefully with those, um, with that, we'll start building a fire program again. 
the biggest problem with us is we have a lot of wooey. And um, there's a lot of people that don't want any, they don't even want um, thinning going on in their backyard. So we have a lot of that kind of uh, issue. But I think, uh, I think we're, we're moving on the right track. We're working with the national forest systems, um, trying to do monitoring on prescribed fires that they're doing so we can show the results that they're meeting their objectives and that, you know, they didn't es escape. And, you know, what about that headline that says, prescribed fire did not escape this time. Why don't we have those? You know, those kinds of successes, um, I think, need to be highlighted more so than the, the ones that do escape. Yes, Sharon. Um, when you followed up with the prescribed burning in the Black Hills, did you, did you get the range of effects that the wildfire produces oh. to, to kind of encourage or keep, um, um, to keep encouraging that, that range of the structure and the development of the, of the Sure. So the question was um, when we did the prescribed fire in, in the, the reburn, whether um, we achieved the, the fire effects that we might see in a wildfire. In some cases we did, especially the high severity burned at high severity again. Um, um, but yeah, we did, we, we definitely got a lot of low severity. And in fact, it was pretty, I have some really cool pictures. The flames were um, jumping from snag, stand and snag to stand and snag. So we had flame lengths um, 20 feet tall they, they were ignited with ping pongs, so it was just like a, and they did 1,500 acres in a day. And so they, it burned a little hot in some places, but in, in, in most cases, I don't think that we ever get the prescribed fire equal into what a wildfire a fire effect is, but I think that one was, was much closer um, in terms of um, any prescribed fire that had been on previously there, because they typically try to get like the foot flame length and they call it good. And I'm like, why did you even burn really? Uh, there's no one here from the Black Hills, right? <laughs> That's everywhere. I mean, I see that a lot, you know, and it's just like, well, we need to be being more aggressive if we're trying to, to um, impact our forests like a, a natural wildfire would. Um, so maybe we need to actually double our intervals. Or, you know, there's, there's lots of different ways you can do it. Um, but yeah, I think it was, Semi-close. Are we done? Thanks. Yeah.